All right, uh, case five is a 30 year old woman with a back nodule and the clinical diagnosis of course is sebaceous cyst. You know, I've said it before and I'll say it again and again until the day I die, everything's a cyst until it's not a cyst because anytime you get a nodule in the deep dermis or subcutis, doesn't matter what that nodule is made of, metastatic tumor, sweat gland tumor, sarcoma, benign spindle cell tumor, a nodule growing deep underneath the skin is going to look like a skin colored bump. And most of the time, cysts being common, it will be a cyst, right? But there's no way to really know unless it's got a draining punctum and is draining smelly keratinaceous debris, or unless you get a biopsy and we look and say it's a cyst. So I really harp on that to my med students and my, um, and all of my trainees. And the reason is that I've seen so many things that were thought to be cysts. Sometimes, you know, the patient was reassured for years and then a biopsy was done and it ended up being a sarcoma that was slow growing or a sweat gland malignancy. Or I actually have a little box of slides that's labeled not a cyst. And one day I'll like make a video montage and put online to, to help um, highlight that point. So anyway, okay, that's my preaching about, about cysts just because I, I work with a lot of uh, cancer groups online on Facebook and I uh, particularly like the dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans group. Many of them were misdiagnosed for a long time as having a cyst and then it ended up being, you know, a, a sarcoma. So so that's a, a topic I like to like to really you know, uh, push hard to, to try to make a point. Okay. Thank you for listening to my, my uh, sermon on that. And now we'll look at the case. Who wants to take this one? All right. I'll give it a shot. Good. So the first thing I really notice is that you get this sparing of the superficial dermis. Um, and if you look towards the bottom of the sample, you can see some extension into the fat. And then when we go on to a higher power, we notice there are spindle cells kind of in that swirled story form look. Mm -hmm. um, you'll also notice some like giant cells in there. Um, it's not very mitotically active. There's also not much atypia in there going on. Um, so on my differential, I had a DF, uh, a dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans and like a fibrous histiocytoma, uh, dermatofibroma, and that's what I came up with so far. So dermatofibroma or fibrous histiocytoma, which to me are the same thing. We just, it, derm paths, we like to call them dermatofibroma. Soft tissue people sometimes like to call them fibrous histiocytoma or benign fibrous histiocytoma. But to me, just different names all for the same thing. And then DFSP, and you're right, that's, you went straight to the heart of the matter. The differential is between those two things here. That's almost always what it's going to come down to. Is this a DF or is it a DFSP? And usually, even without immunostains, with practice, you can tell these apart most of the time. Do you have a preference? You got a 50-50 shot. Um... I'm going to go with the fibrous histiocytoma. Good job. Well done. Yeah, this is a fibrous histiocytoma slash dermatofibroma. And the clues that can help you. So from low power, look, this thing's deep. It, it does start up here in the dermis, okay? But it's it's kind of in the deep dermis rather. You know, a lot of times dermatofibromas are up here in the mid-reticular dermis and they push up close to the epidermis and you see epidermal change over them. But sometimes dermatofibromas can arise in the deep dermis and push way down into the subcutis or even be centered completely in the subcutis. And rarely they can even be like deep in the muscle. That's pretty uncommon, but it does happen. Okay, so people really get freaked out when they see a big, huge DF that's got a lot of cellularity and it's going way down into the fat and there's some fat entrapment at the edges. And that's the stuff that DFSP is supposed to do, right? Invading the fat and trapping the fat. And so people can really go down the tubes and make a mistake because they say, but that it's in the fat. Look, it's gotta be dermatofibrous sarcoma protuberans. No, dermatofibromas can also infiltrate the fat, usually not as dramatically. And I feel like when they do, they kind of like push the fat out of the way and you just get a little bit of clusters of fat trapped at the edge, but sometimes it can be more, more dramatic. Okay. And I would personally call this one a cellular dermatofibroma or cellular fibrous histiocytoma. Now, how do you decide that there's, you know, I've seen DFs that have increased cellularity, but, but some people like to reserve the term cellular dermatofibroma for when they do this when they make not just kind of swirling story forming or, or sheets of cells, but actual like really broad, you know, really intersecting fascicles that almost begin to have that kind of herringbone pattern of intersecting fascicular uh, growth, okay? And cellular DFs tend to be bigger and deeper and push down deeper into the skin. And because of that, they have a higher um, tendency to 
recur. And I say that with air quotes, I, I guess p viewers at home can't see my air quotes. But the reason is, is that a lot of times the reason that these things grow back is not that they're an aggressive, uh, rapidly growing process, but it's because a lot of times they get sampled partially. They get a shave biopsy or a punch taken out of the middle of something that's the size of, you know, a golf ball. And then of course it's going to keep growing because only a part of it was removed. So I feel like most of the time when I see them grow back, that's the situation. I've seen some that were kind of rapidly growing and did seem to be locally aggressive, but I would say that's a definitely a distinct minority of cases. Cellular DFs, um, you know, people get kind of worried about them because there are very rare examples of dermatofibroma uh, that metastasize to the lungs usually. Um, and the ones that do metastasize tend to be the big, deep cellular or aneurysmal dermatofibromas. There's no way to predict which ones will do that. And I do not bring this up in my pathology report because it's so rare. And I feel like that generates unnecessary angst, just like we don't go tell every patient with a basal cell carcinoma. Well, you know, sometimes these metastasize and kill people. Yes, it's true, but it's super rare. So um, that, at least when I was a fellow, that was Dr. Weiss's advice to not you know, initiate that conversation in the report. And I feel like she's someone who has, uh, and I hope I'm not wrong in, in, in putting that out there and perhaps her views have changed since, but I actually really like that. And I feel like she's someone who has a, a real great thought about how to approach things clinically in a way that's best for the patient. And I, in, that, in addition to diagnostic derm or um, soft tissue pathology, I learned a lot about her from like how to approach things in a way that provides um, excellent patient care. Okay, so anyway, that, that's, I just wanted to bring that up because that conversation comes up a lot. So when I sign these out, and at some point I'll put, I'm working on, um, I have a bunch of saved templates for how I sign out reports. I'm working on releasing those online. It's gonna take me some time, but eventually I'll put this out. But what I usually do is say cellular dermatofibroma with a comment, these often extend deeper into the skin than regular dermatofibromas. And because of it, they have a higher uh, chance of persisting or recurring. And it's, I personally think it's optional if you wanna completely excise them. Some people feel you should always do it. I think it's kind of up to the patient and the doctor. If it doesn't grow back, then great. If it does, well then just go excise it at that point. Um, I definitely do not think that they need like a wide local excision or, or even require negative margins. Anecdotally, if you remove the bulk of the tumor, usually they're not gonna grow back, okay? So now, what about the diagnosis, right? I've told you all that preaching stuff. I feel better now. I, I needed to get that off my chest. This is like a uh, therapy for me. My wife's a psychiatrist, but she gets tired of having to, to be my therapist all the time. So, so I have to shift that burden to, to residents and fellows. Usually the audience laughs at that point, but you know, in the, the days of Zoom, it's hard for me to tell if my jokes are landing or not. My wife really is a psychiatrist though. Okay, um, so here's some features that can help you tell apart dermatofibroma, cellular or otherwise, versus DFSP. Number one, the cells of dermatofibroma kind of paradoxically are more atypical than the cells of DFSP. DFSP has very thin, bland, very uniform, stretched out cells. They all look just like each other because they have a translocation. Dermatofibromas or fibrocysteocytoma tend to have more plump, kind of fat, juicy cells. I don't know if you, if you like that word, but they tend to have larger nuclei. Sometimes they'll have scattered pleomorphism. Some people call those monster cells. Don't put that in a report. That'll freak patients out, okay? But look, these guys, these are big. They're big cells, right? They're big and they kind of have, they have not really ugly nuclei, but they're bigger nuclei and they're round or oval. Some of them have a punctate nucleoli in the center. I don't, I, hopefully that's showing up for you. The presence of giant cells, multinucleated histiocytes, is a really useful clue for dermatofibroma. They're not always there, but when you find giant cells, sometimes even Teuton giant cells, when you find foamy histiocytes or xanthoma cells, when you find pockets of blood or hemosiderin deposition, even just focally, those are all things that point strongly towards dermatofibroma and away from DFSP. So this one didn't, I didn't see a good area of blood or foam cells, but the giant cells, I love that you picked up on that. It's a subtle clue that, that you might uh, be tempted to overlook, but you picked up on it. Also, there's a, a sprinkling of inflammatory cells in here. Sometimes that happens. Um, so I think this is a nice um, cellular dermatofibroma. And again, there's some fat trapping at the edge. And recently there was a nice paper, I think by Raj Patel's group from Michigan, about when you have fat invasion, or I hate to use the word invasion, but entrapment of fat by a dermatofibroma tends to produce some fat necrosis. You'll begin to see some little foamy histiocytes, some breakdown of the adipocytes, whereas in DFSP, the fat is, is not really damaged or broken down. There's not any fat necrosis. It's just 
totally wrapped by tumor cells. And I had never really paid attention. See, here's a little fat necrosis here. But actually, once I saw that paper, I think that definitely holds true. I had just not thought about that before. But I think now that I've, I've started paying attention to it more, and that definitely works pretty nicely. So finally, let's talk about immunostains. If, you had, if I only gave you one immunostain to tell these apart, what would you pick? I'm cruel, I know, it's not fair, but only one stain. CD34? CD34, that's exactly what I'd pick. Factor 13A, people love to talk about for dermatofibroma. It will stain a lot of scattered dendritic cells in the background of the DF, but I personally don't find it that useful, so I don't, I don't really use Factor 13A for soft tissue tumors personally, but I know a lot of great pathologists who do, so if you like it and find it helpful, go for it. But ZD34 is a pretty reliable marker. It's going to usually be strongly positive in DFSP. And in dermatofibromas, negative, although there's a little trick. The middle of the DF will be negative. But at the periphery, particularly where it butts up against the rest of the dermis, it's going to actually usually have kind of a strong staining halo or a peripheral kind of ring of CD34. And sometimes that can confuse people because it can be pretty strong. And in small DFs, it can kind of be confusing or if you have a funny tangential cut. And then look at this, here's the collagen trapping. That is a useful clue for dermatofibroma, but DFSP can do that also sometimes. So, um, and oh, one last little tip. I've got a whole video about dermatofibroma. As you can tell, I really like it, and so I'll talk about it forever. But, you know, a lot of times you see epidermal hyperplasia. There's a little bit of it here. You often see that over DF, but I feel that the deeper a DF is, the further away from the epidermis it is, the less it tends to exert that effect. So don't be surprised if you don't see any tabling or epidermal induction changes over top of a DF when you have one like this that's way down in the deep dermis and subcutis. So cellular dermatofibroma, I think that's a pretty nice example of one. Okay, I, uh, and just as a quick contrast, I have a video, a short video about DFSP, and one day I'll make a full length one. For contrast, this is dermatofibrous sarcoma protuberans. Just so you can see, look how thin and bland. And in fact, you can see how these cells look a lot like the cells in some of those entities we were discussing earlier. They look very similar to superficial acrofibromyxoma cellular angiofibroma of the genitals, mammary type myofibroblastoma, spindle cell lipoma, thin, bland fibroblastic cells, not much atypia at all. Uh, paradoxically, even though this is a sarcoma, it's a translocation sarcoma, so it has uniform cells, it does not have pleomorphism, extremely rare to see pleomorphism in DFSP, very, very rare. It can have some myxoid change, and this is the kind of fat entrapment. Little fat cells completely wrapped and trapped, and look, this all used to be subcutis, and the tumor has just gone from the dermis and blown away and invaded deeply, deeply into the fat, leaving this honeycomb pattern of fat entrapment. This is dermatofibrous sarcoma protuberans. And again, I've got a video that I'll, if, when you, if you're watching this online, I'll put a link down below to some videos that may be helpful.